Stan Jabalisco here again, ham radio operator and station W1GV, Whiskey One Golf Victor. I'm going to talk a little bit more about wave propagation on various frequencies in the amateur radio allocation empire. The mode that I'd like to talk about now is called Meteor scatter propagation. What in the world is that, you might ask? Well, remember the ionosphere? I talked about that a few videos ago. The, the layers of the ionosphere, or the ionized regions of the atmosphere above the Earth, can return radio waves to the Earth at certain frequencies, mostly those frequencies below about 70 megahertz, although occasionally some E-layer effects might occur a little higher in frequency than that. But there's another thing that can cause ionization of the Earth's upper atmosphere besides the Sun and besides cosmic radiation. That is meteors coming down from space. Meteoroids, rocks in space, enter the Earth's atmosphere and become meteors if they manage to survive all the way to the surface without burning up and, and we find the rocks on the surface then they are meteorites and of course if they're big enough <laughs> then they'll call them a bolide or an asteroid or something like that which uh, I think we'd have more to worry about than uh, radio wave communication if we had an asteroid impact but meteors as they pass through the Earth's upper atmosphere ionize it in little trails. Uh, meteors tend to, f to fall to the Earth in parallel paths in specific bursts or clusters or also known as meteor showers. And they actually occur at predictable times of the year and seem to come out of particular regions in the sky. They might name them things like the Geminids for meteors that seem to come from the constellation Gemini. They might, uh, there's another well known one called the that's a hard one to spell, Perseids, which seem to come from the constellation Perseus. And they uh, fall in parallel paths and sometimes quite large numbers in short periods of time. And when they do that, they create ionized trails at specific altitudes in the upper atmosphere. Just like an aircraft under the right conditions will produce a vapor trail, also known as a contrail, of water vapor or water droplets, like little clouds, so uh, meteors, as they pass through the ionosphere, where the atmosphere is sensitive to ionization, the heat and uh, e effects of the meteor passing through will cause a trail of ionization to form at specific altitudes along the meteor's path after it has gone by. And those trails, uh, I, uh, they, they'll call them meteor trails or of ionized gases in the upper atmosphere and those ionized trails those meteor trails can reflect radio signals to the earth in much the same way as the regular ionosphere does so I'm gonna just illustrate a couple of examples here for you Suppose we have a, a station right here and it transmits a radio wave and it strikes one of these meteor trails. And then it comes back to Earth at some distant point where another radio ham is listening. And for a very few seconds, while that ionization lasts right here, this distant station over here will be able to hear the signals from this one here. Well, now suppose that this happens multiple times because of multiple meteor trails occurring in rapid succession. It can happen over various different paths. Maybe it'll come off of this one and 
bounce back down like that. And then maybe a few seconds later after that other one, just before that other one has died out, we get lucky again and another meteor trail appears. So you can actually communicate. These two stations can actually communicate with each other as these signals bounce off these trails. They tend to come from different parts of the sky, though. You can't just aim your antenna at one region and expect to get optimum communications all the time. For a few seconds, it'll come from here. And from a few seconds, it'll come from here. And a few seconds, it'll come from here. So clearly this station over here, this receiving station, can't point an antenna in any specific direction and leave it there and expect to continuously hear the signals. They have to have a very good antenna that has a wide uh, field of view, as it were, so that it can encompass all of these different uh, paths and all of these different signals. Well, if you look up at the sky, imagine that you could look up at the sky and take a time exposure photograph and point it at the specific point where those meteors seem to be coming from. Now, remember, the paths are parallel, more or less. But when you look at them in perspective from the surface, they always seem to radiate from a specific point in space. That point is known as the radiant, the radiant. And these meteor trails over time, one of them here, one of them here, one of them here. And you might get, uh, oh, various different ionized trails. I'll give a, give a little bit different color now. Let's, uh, let's do something a little brighter. For a moment, you might uh, you might hear a signal coming from here and a little few seconds later you'd hear one coming from here a few seconds later another one coming from there clearly you can't point your antenna there's another one and then another one back near here again comes pretty close to the same path then one from way out here so you're going to hear this signal in a kind of a it's kind of like a moving target. Your signal is moving around. And it, but if you have enough meteors falling fast enough, you can get a pretty nearly continuous link between those two stations. It's a tricky way to communicate, but if you manage to do it, it's a great deal of fun. It tends to occur primarily uh, in the upper region, uh, upper part of the HF spectrum, maybe the 15 meter, 10 meter bands, and it can also occur on 50 megahertz, I believe. But uh, it's a very interesting and fascinating mode known once again as meteor scatter propagation. So that is technically a form of ionospheric propagation, but it's a, a whole lot of fun. Meteor Scatter Propagation. You'd think after writing all these books, millions of words, that I'd be able to type better than I do. But I just use brute force and keep pecking away. Stan Gibalisco, W1GV. Here is my call sign. W1GV. You will rarely hear me say W1 Golf Victor on the air because I almost never use voice modes. I tend to use modes called CW, also known as Morse code, and also Phase Shift Keying, PSK, technically PSK31, phase shift keying 31 mostly on 14 18 and 21 and 24 megahertz i'm trying to use those bands 18 and 24 megahertz more because they're kind of exotic and they're kind of fun and also when you have a contest that's causing congestion on the 14 and 21 megahertz bands 
the 18 and 24 megahertz bands, uh, they usually are free of that contest if you want to look for something else. On the other hand, contests are great for testing antennas. And, uh, I don't know, I wonder if they have a meteor scatter contest. Do you suppose they do? If they do, let me know. You know, tell me about it. I've heard, I think I've heard about Moon Bounce competition, EME, Moon Bounce. And maybe I'll do a video on that uh, after a little while. But, happy radio hamming, Stan Jabalisco, W1GV, saying 73 and so long.